Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for our Theatre Art Life discussion with The Electric Canvas, and welcome. Before I introduce you to these wonderful gentlemen um, and all of this information we're going to talk about soon, I'd like to just take you through some of our housekeeping. So if you've never um, joined us before, you know what we're about. So um, we're on Webinar Jam, so in the chat box on the right, you can ask questions, say where you're from, give a shout out, and talk to us whenever you want from the chat box. Uh, if for any reason you drop out, you can log back anytime via the email link that we sent you. Uh, if you can't hear us, same thing, log out, log back in again. And if you have internet issues today, uh, a replay is always available and will be sent to you personally 24 hours after this session. So thank you for joining us. All right, so here we have Peter Milne and Richard D'Souza from The Electric Canvas. So welcome guys, and thank you for joining us. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for having us, Anna. Fantastic. But before I'm going to get into discussing with you, I'm going to show everybody here your wonderful highlights video. So uh, if anyone doesn't know, The Electric Canvas is based in Australia and here is some of their work. Amazing stuff. <laughs> so that is a lot of a big portfolio of work, Peter. So let's start with you and give me a, a little bit of history about your uh, starting the electric canvas and then your work within it. Uh, your microphone is off. Oh, no, it's not. We lost you. No, that's all right. That's my yeah. fault. That's a good start. <laughs> Uh, look, firstly, welcome everybody, no matter what time zone you're in, good morning, evening or uh, afternoon. And I hope everyone's staying well in this uh, challenging COVID world we now live in. We're particularly fortunate in our part of the world uh, that we have seem to at the moment have things under control. So I hope the same is with you. And I know that those of you that are in uh, special events or anything that involves entertaining the public have been uh, adversely affected by all of this, as many industries have. So we're hoping a, a speedy recovery for everyone. Thank you for your introduction, Anna. And um, the Electric Canvas was started in uh, in 1997 after I uh, visited Paris and seen a, a wonderful innovation in uh, projection, which I'll talk about in a while. Um, and we've grown from there. Uh, we started with the uh, with the French PG projector, which I'll talk about, and now we've got many many projectors of different types and mostly digital. Uh, Richard joined us uh, a couple of years ago as our art director and heads up a team of artists, internal artists and freelancers that we work with regularly. And uh, Richard will tell you a lot about uh, his background and uh, and uh, how we approach our work. The thing that's a little bit different about the electric canvas is that they were like a one-stop shop. We not only uh, design projects and create the content, but we also deliver them. So we've got projectors, scaffolding systems, media servers, uh, even the cladding that goes on the scaffolding. The only thing we don't have in the house is generators. So we're pretty much a, a, a one-stop shop. And that came about because uh, when we started what was not known as projection mapping was just known as architectural projection. We were using big slide projectors like the PG, Parney, and other brands from the, the deep distant past. And they were very unforgiving. There were no zoom lenses. There were no uh, lens shift or any form of distortion correction or, uh, or warping or geometry at all in the projector. You had to get it right. You either got it right or it was wrong. Once you printed the film, if it was wrong, it just didn't fit. So we learned through a hard taskmaster and we decided that people that we relied upon for that sort of accuracy 
didn't quite get it either, scaffolders and the like. So, you know, they couldn't understand why we wanted a particular platform at, uh, within a couple of inches or 50 millimetres of, uh, of a specified height and uh, a similar sort of uh, location on the ground. Uh, so we just decided to do it ourselves and we've been doing that ever since. So we're pretty much a, a one-stop shop and we can do, guarantee the, the accuracy and delivery of what we do. These days in the world of video projectors, there's a lot more parameters that can be adjusted. But coming from those uh, slide projector routes, and we still use those, which I'll talk to in, in a moment, uh, was a good taskmaster. It uh, taught us to uh, measure twice and cut once. Um, and uh, we've done some pretty, pretty amazing projects with that technology, uh, uh, with those restrictions as our, as our guide. Um, the electric canvas these days has got 15 permanent staff across administration and marketing, um, content uh, design and delivery, uh, technical uh, design and technical delivery. So um, uh, we expand our workforce as the projects um, uh, require it. And we've got a, a, a very good team of freelance um, uh, designers, artists and technicians uh, that, uh, that we use uh, on our projects. We work predominantly these days in Australia, but we uh, our past has seen us in uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, some work in Europe and the Americas. But um, these days we, uh, we've we uh, got a good market at home. We like to stay at home uh, quite uh, quite a lot. And of course, <laughs> in this COVID world, it's becoming difficult even to work at home. Uh, our individual states have got locked down still. We've got one of our senior technicians who's halfway through a 14 day quarantine in, in Perth, waiting to set up Christmas there. And we've got other logistic problems that are changing day by day as dictated by public health orders, et cetera. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about, uh, about our philosophy before I uh, hand over to Richard for, for, to talk about uh, process. Uh, our philosophy is that uh, projection mapping or any sort of large projection event is a theatrical experience. It not only involves a target that you project images onto, it involves the audience and it involves the the audience in the way they react with buildings in particular that they might walk past every day and think nothing of. We like to, you know, light them in a way that uh, brings them to life in a different sense. And I, we find quite often that after we've done that, as will many of you that have worked with this uh, genre, uh, will have noted that people never look the same way at those struct structures and buildings again. So uh, we like to think of it as a theatrical experience. What does the viewer see when they first arrive? What is their experience when they first see and hear the content? Um, how long are they going to stay there? You know, do, does uh, one person on one side of a site get a different, different perspective or a different message than somebody on another? part of the site. We also believe that the tech, uh, the technical design informs the creative and vice versa. Uh, we always treat uh, projecting on the buildings in particular as an exercise in architectural lighting first and foremost, well before we, we visit um, uh, the world of, of imagery. Um, my background uh, started in school theatre and, um, and uh, you know, I've, I've always had that that passion to to light something well first before theming it. So that's one of the things that we, we always think about. And it's perhaps one of the more challenging things when we're bringing new designers in to get them to think about the three dimensional form of architecture. And not only that, but to put themselves at the site uh, rather than just in front of a screen in a darkened room. So um, that's that's important for us. Another part, one of our mandates is to is to take on challenges and work the challenges. We don't take risks, but we take on risky briefs. And uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's really important that uh, that you think outside the box and work out ways to to do things that other people may be telling you is not possible. And one of the stories I often tell about us living miles away from the Americas and. Uh, and Europe where all this started in particular in Europe. And when we started, there was nobody there to tell us we couldn't do things. So we just figured out how to do them and went and did them. And we're doing that to, to today. We've had a lot of instances where, where people with a lot more knowledge and experience than us have told us, oh, why are you doing this? It's not possible. And uh, we've worked a way to do it and, uh, and we've done it. 
and uh, uh, we've enjoyed a great deal of success through that process and uh, uh, we, we intend to continue to, to solve the problems as they come up and to take on those difficult and challenging briefs because at the end of the day they are very satisfying to deliver. Um, so we believe that the creative design combined with the technical design yields more than the sum of its parts um, and uh, that's why we create content as well as do all the technical design and delivery. Um, we, we've also found over the years that there's in some challenging situations there's only one practical approach that works and uh, uh, it, the trick is just to find that practical approach and to and to harness it. Uh, the genres we work in uh, uh, generally we break them down into decorative projection, themed projection, uh, transformative, we love transforming structures into something completely different and challenging the imagination, narratives, uh, Sonne Lumiere and and other uh, other pieces that have got a, a story or a message, and that have particularly a cultural message, and uh, and we like to blur the line between art and entertainment because a, a lot of this uh, this work we do is considered entertainment, but we like to also consider it as art. So um, the type of engagements we we, we work on uh, is usually a complete design and deliver, but we also collaborate a lot with external artists and that goes all the way from working with experienced artists that have worked in the projection uh, realm before to mentoring new artists or even artists from different genres altogether. We've worked with even glass blowers, we've worked with textile artists, we've worked with photographers, we've worked with sculptors and uh, all of which have been terrified about putting their uh, vision into the architectural form and uh, we get a great deal of pleasure and satisfaction working with the, with those people and, and taking them into that world and, and uh, having them really happy with with the outcomes and the deliverables. Um, so uh, we also do technical des design and integration um, uh, into other shows where there might be multimedia, which is an old term, but still a, a good one. Uh, and we do some work in ceremonies in public events, not very much, but we've done some pretty notable things. We were, we were at Sochi for the uh, Winter Olympics. We were at Vancouver for the Winter Olympics. We've done Summer Olympics. We've done a Paralympics. We've done uh, a number of uh, those international ceremonies, three Commonwealth Games, uh, uh, East Asian Games, two Asian Games, um, Southeast Asian Games, two of those. So we like to work with that. And we like to work in that area too, because it, it brings us into contact with wonderful, experienced, uh, versatile teams of people like Anna. Uh, that's where I think <laughs> Anna in a ceremonious environment um, that are used to working under pressure, used to supporting each other across the boundaries of their uh, of their crafts uh, and their um, uh, their jobs um and responding very quickly to uh to changes between rehearsals or to changes of client sentiment or client endeavor um, in those instances you're generally working for people that will only do a ceremony once the organizers the organizing committees but you're working with people that have done many and it's a very very rewarding genre to work in and uh, and those people circulate the world and just do that stuff i mean the Friends I made at Sydney 2000, which was my first uh, uh, foray into uh, into public events of that size. Uh, those people are still out there, uh, mostly Australians, uh, touring the world, uh, going from ceremony to ceremony, and uh, it's uh, it's great to see see those people and to and to meet with old friends and work with them in those situations. Um, I don't know who's got a drill going, but it's not me. <laughs> I can hear that. Uh, so um, we do a lot of building projections. We do some indoor transformations. We do ground projections, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And we've developed some interactive uh, applications for projections. So um, my background uh, is um, basically, as I said, I started in school theatre. Uh, so I knew what I wanted to do from a very early age, even from <laughs> before I was a teenager. and. Uh, uh, from there, I went on to uh, to do um, uh, a career in rock and roll for eight years, which uh, taught you how to be versatile and how to turn unlikely places into uh, transformed venues and theatrical experiences for those audiences. Then I 
I did a few years of corporate productions as a uh, uh, or, or uh, industrial theater, as you might call it in the US, uh, where you know I uh, learned to call shows and uh, also uh, designed productions and acted as a production manager and uh, and technical director. So I'll, I'll throw over to Richard. I'll give you a little bit of uh, background in, into his um, his history um, and what's led him to the electric canvas. And then we'll talk more specifically about the processes. Richard. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I might be interrupted. There's a guy outside who's decided to turn up with a leaf blower. So. <laughs> Convenient. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so my background is um, I was a 3D artist in architectural visualization for about a decade. Um, so I've always had, you know, I've, I've, an affinity with the built form and, you know, uh, have a good understanding of, you know, the spatial qualities going from screen to, you know, a actual built structure. Um, so uh, that's come in, uh, in a, you know, it's a very useful aspect to what I'm doing now. Um, after doing that for 10 years, I sort of moved into the live event scene in Australia, creating content and VJing and doing live events in Australia. So I worked in, uh, a lot of the Australian music festivals uh, started off in the big day out, doing visuals in the boiler room there. Um, then EDM music sort of took off and I started doing a lot of the electronic music festivals in Australia. Um, Future Music Festival, Stereosonic. I was um, the main stage content manager on Stereosonic for a couple of years. Um, then I started doing a lot of touring work, um, touring with artists around Australia creating their live show identities, um, worked with Peking Duck, um, Australian uh, EDM musicians um, for numerous years, designing their shows, um, started uh, designing shows and playback. So started doing a lot of playback systems, custom systems and touch designer and notch, uh, camera effects, um, do, doing a lot of development for companies in the US, um, for the shows in Coachella and different places around the world. Um, yeah, custom playback systems, custom uh, effects camera systems, um, lots of, you know, touring VJ stuff, mapping, um, sort of expanded into doing a bit of stage concepts. So working as, you know, visual concepts, which expanded into the design of the stage as well. Um, so we're working with some very talented people, developing some amazing stages which you know had a lot of cohesion between the structural space and visually what was going on on the screens as well um yeah and then throughout that time i was doing a lot of architectural uh, mapping as well off and on and then an opportunity came up at the electric canvas and i joined and it's been um it's been a, a lot of fun and it's, you know, my, my role is slightly different. It's a little bit less hands-on, more guiding people and, you know, guiding projects. Um, but yeah, it's been going very well. And we refer to Richard as a um, creative technologist as well as an art director because um, uh, we're a small company and a we form our company around the skills of, of the players. So, uh, you know, we've had uh, uh, a head animator that, is also a quirky musician so he's made soundtracks in fact he's freelance now and he still makes soundtracks for us so we're the sort of company that sort of bends and flows with with the skill set of the people uh, within yeah the and i really i think i really like the the you know the way that you combine the technical and the creative as, as a as a one process you know and as we've spoken before peter the pro, the concept that um that they feed each other and they're not mutually exclusive and, and technical people have to be creative in the way that they work work their part of the, the job and the creative also need to completely understand what technical can provide them to maximise their creativity. So, you know, I think electric, the Electric Canvas has, the, uh, you know, has that team, like you said, to, to adapt. So let's talk a little bit about that process for you guys. And um, I know you've got some amazing videos to show us. So kick us into that. Okay, so look, there's a, a when we started this, as I said, it wasn't called projection mapping; it was called architectural projection. And um, and uh, the way we captured the architecture, well, uh, in fact, even before us, people were capturing architecture by projecting a grid with a slide projector on a building, and then 
with a piece of paper mapping the grid points. And uh, we, we took that another step forward and brought back some 1860s technology called a camera obscura, which means we could put the projector lens on the front of a light box and project the light upside down and inverted onto a ground glass uh, or a piece of tracing paper, the first one that we made was, and then actually get under the black hood and trace the building. Then we took it to the next level and replaced the person under the hood with a digital camera. So that's we still use that today if we use the PG workflow to capture the architecture. But um, And uh, that sort of revolutionised what we did uh, and uh, a number of people around the place copied us on that, which is good. So. Um, these days, of course, there's a lot of different workflows with digital mapping. Uh, there seems to be a common understanding that you scan a building and then you make a UV map and unwrap the building, put the content on there and uh, and then rewrap the building. And th that's fine for certain genres, but we've probably got half a dozen different, completely different workflows dictated by what the needs of the project are. Um, a, a lot of uh, mapping that you see around the world and some of the, and some of the most fantastic stuff is quite abstract and uh, works well with that sort of workflow. Uh, but some of the stuff that we do, sometimes you've really just got to look through the lens and see the architectural elements for what they are and make decisions about what you want to see on the side of that column and, and which audience members are going to miss out on this and which are going to miss out on that because architecture is the master you don't beat it you work with it or it will beat you so uh it's always very very good to uh to engage uh, with an open mind as to uh, what sort of workflows you're going to uh, going to use um, quite often if the time frame and the budget is short we'll use what we call pov point of view it's really just taking a photo from where the projector will see the building and um and putting it into Photoshop and tracing it and then using that as a template. And uh, to, in order to do that particular workflow, you've got to know what the the real dimensions of things are as well, because you're looking at a, generally looking at a distorted view of that projector's point of view. So uh, uh, part of the survey work in, involves making those measurements. We call it the metrics. So, uh, you know, if I go out and survey a building, the, the art department will get a, a a bunch of photos, but then they'll get a CAD drawing that I've built for measurements that shows what those actual shapes that we see down the lens, what they really are, um, so that circles stay circles and squares stay squares, and that's a really important part of that process. We've done some quite amazing work using uh, uh, the very quick uh, POV technique, and uh, it shouldn't be underrated. Uh, uh, a lot of big projects that we do, multi-site projects even, came to us on very short lead times and uh, it was the only way we could do it. There wasn't the budget to, to do traditional scanning to, to, uh, to form a point cloud and then decimate that into, into a model, uh, whether it be by photogrammetry, or those who are familiar with that, or LIDAR scanning, which is a laser uh, scanning process. Uh, there's quite not, often not the budget all the time to, to to go down those uh, those paths, although it is a nice path to go down. We generally, and we have for many years, uh, go and measure buildings in the first instance with a instrument called a, a laser total station, which is basically a telescope with a laser built in. So you get X, Y, and Z coordinates of all the points you want. And you end up with an accurate, but very rudimentary wireframe model. And from there, uh, I can actually uh, lay out the projectors and instantly know what the brightness is going to be, what the resolution is going to be. And that's the first step in, in informing the creative process is to light the building first, as I said before, make sure the surfaces that you want to lit are modeled as if they're on a stage and you're in the audience. And um, and then to provide the technical details so that others in the on, on the art department side of things can create an appropriate set of templates, whether they be 2D for After Effects or 3D for Cinema 4D, which is one of our more popular uh, 3D uh, platforms. Um, so, and sometimes we combine those two, uh, those two workflows. So there are a number of sub workflows to those, but they're the two, the two main ones that, that have served us well. Um, so uh, I'll let Richard talk a little bit about both of those processes and how we 
uh, how we utilise them once the survey is being done. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the details of the survey. And then what happens from the point of client brief and how, how you deal with those things and make sure that you're a good provider to your client. Yeah, like we, um, we take things sort of, you know, like a case by case, building by building um, sort of uh, format because um, depending on the building, it's, you know, the building informs what the art, where, where the artwork is going to go in a lot of ways. So we're, we're always looking, you know, for those relationships between the built form, what the client's ambitions are, what, you know, you might be working or collaborating with an artist. So you, you've got to find these, you know, these happy mediums between all those uh, elements. Um, so how we approach each project really depends on the building itself the artwork either supplied or the intent of the creation, uh, where we go as far as templating or designing templates for a building. Because um, we're, we're always thinking about the artists or the freelancers which come in, like what's going to work best for them to get the outcomes you need. And sometimes if you're doing a very 2D orientated project, like a, a sort of, you know, a more traditional flatter canvas can be very, you know, um, uh, beneficial to those artists, um, sort of identifying spaces, you know, like main action spaces and, you know, small accents and, you know, sort of informing them through the template of how they can develop those ideas. Um, some t a lot of the time we do a lot of uh, previs of um, the artwork. So we use 3D models and then you know, either simulate projection on the 3D model. We can do things like simulate the shadowing from the uh, projectors on the model so we can identify problems even before we get to site. Um, yeah, so there's, you know, like there, there's many ways we tackle projects. Mm. And when you work with the artists in terms of, um, I guess I, when I think about some, say, tricky architecture, like, say, the Sydney Opera House, you know, that has a very distinct form. And, and are you there helping them shape their artwork across it or are they, and, or are they giving you the, the content and you're shaping it on, on in the 3D model? It, it, how, what's the connection there? Oh, it's, it's definitely like a, a consisting, con, consistent sort of working back and forth. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we have staff who have worked on a lot of those buildings like multiple times. Um, so we sort of, you know, like uh, it's definitely a process of nurturing the artwork into existence over time. So you sort of identify problems like you, you want to give people space to be as creative as possible. You know, like you, you want people to have enough autonomy in their design that they uh, you know, that, that people respond better artistically when they've got some sort of, you know, um, ownership over what they're doing. So it's about, you know, nurturing ideas into existence um, mm. and, you know, but giving guidance where guidance needs to be given to uh, get mm. the outcomes that we need. Yes, and then there's the disruptor. <laughs> That's me. I walk into the room and say, but what about from this angle? Uh, you mentioned <laughs> House. And it's a it's a classic example because the opera house, the postcard view of the opera house doesn't see it as a three dimensional sculpture. It sees it as a series of arcs. Mm -hmm. However, when you start to move away from where the projectors are, which is where those photos are normally taken from, and you move around circular key to other viewpoints, you realise that it takes on a depth, and that those those arches are in fact receding arches that that um, that. Uh, uh, segments of spheres so you know you have to what you you might fall into traps of putting a figure of a person on on a sail and their heads at the top looks fine from from uh, one vantage point but it'll look grotesque from another vantage point as if somebody's laying over backwards on top of a three-dimensional object so it's it's always good to challenge people to put their heads where the audience is rather than on the screen and that's one of the most difficult things and um, uh, even from a scale point of view to understand the scale which then relates to the speed if you've got animations that are moving across your screen you've got to understand that in miles an hour or kilometers an hour if you like because on a larger scale that can be a very frantic animation can so make it easy. yeah so there's <laughs> a lot of uh, and this is where uh, where the uh, technical and 
and creative uh, have have a healthy conversation as well, and also those that are out on site that observe these things. And it's it's always a process. I'm always walking the room and saying, you don't have enough photos of the building you're working on from various different angles. So, you know, that's my disruptive role, if you like, that keeps people you know, not locked into their screens, but mm. testing things in the real world. And uh, Richard's mentioned about doing pre-visualisation really helps that as well. It's something we didn't have a few years ago. Um, so if I could just talk a little bit about the uh, the uh, the client brief, um, uh, because that's sometimes where the magic starts, sometimes where the problems start, but it's always <laughs> where the job starts. So, yeah. uh, you know, obvious questions like what is the lead time? And, and you know, many clients don't have a good concept of how long things take, especially when there's survey involved, especially if they're remote locations. Uh, so what is the location? What is the objective of what they're trying to do? Is there a message? Who are the audience? Um, uh, what assets will be available if, if there is a message that's, uh, uh, that comes with this? Um, you know, you've got to really get them into the mindset uh, that a building is never a screen. You can't treat a building as a screen. I quite often tell people we've got 100 projectors but no screens except the one that rolls down in the meeting room. Um, uh, so you've really got to get the, the client thinking about the difficulties before you start to work the solutions out. Uh, you know, quite often they won't have an idea of what building they want to use, um, you know, and they won't know what's suitable or what's not. There's a lot of discussion around that. You've got to d develop strategies early around around those challenges and involve the client in those strategies so they understand because you don't want them upselling to their clients uh, something that's unrealistic or can't be managed. Um, so what's the audience experience? Uh, does everybody need to see everything with the Opera House? It's quite simple. Everyone does see everything. But if you're in a different part of Circular Key where the Opera House is housed, um, you might see things very differently, as I just said. Um, is it a wide point of view or a field of view or is it a narrow point of view? Are we looking down an alleyway at a building or does the building have to talk to us from very wide angles and from different distances as well? Uh, you know, our, our case study we'll go get onto a little bit later uh, talks about a structure that you can be metres away from, you know, literally 10, 20 metres or yards away from, but you can also be looking from 850 yards or metres away from as well. And how do you deal with both of those realities, both of those um, situations? Um, you know, what is the impact of what you're doing when people arrive, when they come around that corner, when they drive past, does it catch their attention? And what are the dwell times? You know, how long do you want them to be there? Um, how many times do you want them to see it? And that comes into, into its own in, in a COVID world, for instance, where you want to bring people back out on the streets, but you don't want them to hang around in groups. There's a lot of very new strategies and new thinking around how to deal with that. And uh, mm. all of our Christmas projects, of which I think we've got five sites going up for Christmas around the country, that's all in their minds as, as to how to manage that risk to public health. Um, so when you say that, just to translate that, that would be something like the cycle of content is shorter, so that experience is shorter for them and they move on? Absolutely. Or, and yeah. even more radical than that, of, of making a decision not to use sound. And sound is a very powerful adjunct uh, to to projection, of course. You know, you put sound with projection, you get more than some of its parts. But some, uh, some installations that would have a soundtrack this year won't because people consider that a soundtrack helps gather people together. I don't quite agree with that, but that's the determination of that particular organiser. Yeah, it is interesting. And uh, just whether or not you have a holding state or whether you have things on continuous repeat, quite often mm -hmm. we'll do a five or a seven minute show and then go into a holding state with a countdown so people know that they, if they hang around for the next four minutes and 20 seconds, they'll get to see it again. Um, or do you run it back to back so people go, oh, I've seen this before, I'll move on. Mm. So those sort of strategies are very much in the in the forefront of uh, of planning these uh, projections. That's so, that's so fascinating because usually you want people to maximise their time in front of your installation, but now you're navigating, Absolutely. come see it, but don't stay too long, move on. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, that's it. Come into the city, but don't hang around. And how do you do that? That's, that's quite mm. difficult. But... Uh, 
you know, there is a there is a public need in all parts of the world for people to to, to take back their cities and their towns, and to enjoy uh, entertainment and the arts and culture again, uh, whereas they've been deprived of that. So what's the what's the the toolbox in putting these things together? You know, there's storytelling, there's music and narration. Uh, narration is a very powerful tool for storytelling, of course. Um, do we have to use brand and marketing material? That can be the most difficult thing. You can decorate a building. There's not many buildings you can't apply a decorative or even a thematic thing uh, treatment to. But as soon as you start putting brands on buildings, are you doing the brand justice? Are you being corporate correct? Uh, those things are important when there's sponsors and supporters that need to be recognised uh, in their corporate uh, world. And um, I imagine that would be fussy about the colour quality of their brand, right? Like that you deliver the colour and also the, the, the shape and everything that it looks absolutely. like. Absolutely. Mm. Shape in particular, it's an interesting thing, Annie, you mentioned colour because we've projected on red brick buildings and you think that that would limit you enormously. But if you project a white object on a red brick building, the brain tells you it's white. Mm. Now, don't ask me how that happens, but the brain tells you it's white. So it's amazing what you can actually get away with. You, same on a green building. Um, the brain will see that as white, white text mm. or white uh, shapes. Um, so it's generally more the shape and the relationship between the colours. Sometimes we have to do quite a lot of colour correction to keep things corporately correct or even just to render the colour palette that we've decided to use on a particular installation. But it's amazing how the brain works. Uh, mm. with, Getting things together and making assumptions, and it, 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 even after 23 years of doing this, it still amazes me and, uh, uh, and surprises me in a, in a nice way regularly. Um, you've got to consider the stakeholders as well. I mean, there are affected landowners, whether you're putting a projector on somebody's balcony or in somebody's uh, front of somebody's building, or uh, uh, whether you're shining light at somebody's uh, building and you've got to reassure them that the light won't enter any of the private spaces inside. The local government is generally a, a, a stakeholder. You need permits to, to put structures onto footpaths. You need permits in some instances to even project onto buildings. If there's any sort of commercial aspect to what you're doing, you might need a development or, um, authority, a DA as we call it, uh, which is generally quite hard to get. Um, and there's content contributors. Uh, we work a lot with uh, the case study you'll see we've worked with Indigenous content con contributors and Indigenous art in particular is quite fragile. It generally can't be cut and painted and cropped because you break the narrative of it. The narrative is what it's all about. So that's a particular challenging, challenging thing. So you've got to make sure that you're respectful to the content contributors mm. and actually do, uh, do what you're being asked to do without uh, breaking those those rules. Um, there's, as I mentioned, the civil approvals, uh, uh, and then there's a the content approval process as well that you've got to establish with your client very early if there's going to be a single point of contact or whether they, you're going to be getting phone calls, emails, and messages from various stakeholders. Asking, yeah, <laughs> designed by committee, and it's still out there, believe me. And uh, quite often, even though there, you do establish quite firmly that you need a single point of contact for, for briefing, not only briefing, but for the approval process, uh, which is a journey you take on with your client uh, that could be quite lengthy. But you still sense that there's a committee working behind and, and some of the instructions you get do need to clarify. But it's really important to have that single point of uh, contact. And one of the things that I always try to encourage is to under promise and over deliver. Uh, Beware of the artist impression. Uh, mm. You know, you can sell a job that's not deliverable and uh, we've never been about that and we've never been um, uh, subject to that. So uh, I can say that with some pride and uh, uh, that that's uh, an area we don't let ourselves uh, go down. So you be conservative in, in setting clients' expectations, especially if it's a challenging building or site. Uh, and take them along every step of that process to get them on board to sell what you need to sell. And that might be window treatments. It might be turning off lights that normally don't need to be turned off. It might be approaching uh, a building uh, tenant that mm. may not be the least bit interested in, in what somebody else is doing on the outside. So you, you, your client has to be part of your team. They have to understand uh, what 
what the buy-ins are and what the the expectations uh, need in order to be met. So, uh, and and just to something that that's a, that's a difficult one is the client's not always right. Uh, I quite often have people and uh, you know uh, either creative or technical that that will say, "Oh, but the client likes it. The client loves it." That doesn't mean it's going to work. And at the end of the day, if it doesn't work, the client's going to turn around to you guys and say, why didn't you warn me? Why didn't you tell me? Why did you let me do this? And so the, the client's not always right, but in most instances, in fact, almost all, they will appreciate you telling them that mm. because they don't want to be seen to, to be delivering something that, uh, that uh, comes under criticism or just simply doesn't work. Trust your instincts. Give best your best and honest advice um, and that will pay off at the end of, end of the day if you're in doubt about a building or its location and then uh, insist on a test we just did a test last week over three nights it was quite an expensive test on a very big glass building just to prove that certain things didn't work not to prove that certain things did but to prove that certain things didn't work to to give our client the tools necessary so they didn't go down the wrong path with a very serious Uber client that they have um, uh, and promise things that couldn't be delivered. So very, very important that you, you trust your instincts and, uh, and you take your client on that path with you. Uh, you've got to develop a trust with the client. Quite often it's not possible to give them full visualizations of things that quite often isn't the budget. We'd rather be spending the budget on creating beautiful work than doing 3D models and rendering models from different angles, which is time consuming. Uh, and there may not be the opportunity to do it. So you've just got to develop trust with your client. And uh, it's helpful when you've got a body of work, but when you're just starting off, it's the process that you outline to them. It's, it's your understanding of the process. It's your understanding of the building and the circumstances and their brief that will develop that trust. And that's really, really important. So, so sorry, I, I, that's an interesting question for me because, you know, a lot of the time clients do want a visualisation, a big decks to be able to present to their stakeholders and things like that. So, I, and that's something that comes up very often in this part of the world as well, um, trying to visualise everything when I agree with you, so you've got you to get the work done. So how is it that you establish that trust or, you know, I, I think one of your, the key things you said to me is you start to bring them in on the journey and get encourage educate them on your process. So I think that would probably be one aspect of it. But I'm sure that you've got clients that do have insisting on on shit, you know, giving you decks and things like that. How do you then manage that pressure um, within the company or within your relationship? The very short answer to that is they can have all those things if they're prepared to pay for them because they, if they're not in their budget, and they're already coming to us as many clients do. 80% of our clients are government clients and they've all learned that, you know, they can reduce the budget year after year after year and expect more and more and more. And it's just the world we live in. It's a race to the bottom, <laughs> some people say. But, but so they understand very clearly when you say, look, we can give you a visualization, but uh, would you like a quotation for that? Because it is a serious body of work. But to answer your core question about how you communicate to them without doing that, it's, it's in the language. It's it's being firm and saying, I don't think that's going to work. Um, we need to do a test or you need to commission us to do some 3D visualisation. But and, and sticking to those guns, just saying, you know, it's glass building, that's not going to work. Mm. Uh, because at the end of the day, it might cause some frustration or, or friction, but at the end of the day, they, they will thank you for it. But it's in the language because you can, the proof's not going to be in the pudding until the pudding is cooked. And that's generally on site. And, and you've got to get to the stage where a client will trust you to know that when they walk on site on that, after you've finished your projection alignment on what might be the second or third day on site, or even the, the first day on site in some cases, you've got to know that they'll be pleasantly surprised and they have to be pleasantly surprised and mm. walk away confident that they've made the right choices. There is simply no other way in some instances, given lead times and budgets to, to deal with that. Um, mm. I wish it weren't so. Um, so we can talk a, bit, a little bit about advising the clients on site selection. A lot of this is very obvious, but some of it's actually overlooked. I mean, what's the building fabric? I mentioned red brick, I've mentioned glass, uh, you know, there's sandstone, there's, there's white stucco, it's very popular in Asia. Uh, 
you know, some buildings are more uh, are more practical than others. Uh, we've talked about the Sydney Opera House. We like the Sydney Opera House at only 32 lux because it's a big wide building in a very big dark, very dark part of Sydney Harbour. Yeah, uh, that's true. 32 lux wouldn't cut it on a on a heritage building in the middle of a city. We we would be talking 150 or 200. But to do the opera house at 200 would be enormously expensive. I mean, to do it at 32, we use at the moment uh, 16 uh, 30K laser phosphor projectors uh, projected from a distance of generally 450 metres or 420 yards. So um, you set them up across the other side of the harbour, is Absolutely, it? on the overseas passenger okay. terminal. It's wonderful at the moment because there's no cruise ships in the way. So <laughs> sometimes we have to set them up, wait for a cruise ship to leave before we turn them on. So right. <laughs> there are times where we have to project from 650 metres away, which is further up the hill under the approaches to the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Well, so there, those things are all challenges. I'll talk a little bit about those challenges a little later on, especially when there's light up moments and there's no opportunity to check the alignment or that something hasn't been bumped overnight. But we've got strategies, which I'll talk about when it comes to talking about the security of delivery. Um, so uh, what is the audience? Where are they going to be? Affects the site selection. What are the surroundings? Uh, are there other brightly lit buildings? Uh, what's the ambient light? Look for street lights. Look for other lit buildings, advertising signs. You're in Hong Kong. The whole place is lit up by advertising signs. It's the worst place to try and find a good space um, to so, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so that's always a challenge there, you know. Um, so have a look for those things. They will dictate what you need to do as far as the technical coverage, the brightness, the colour palette, the, the artistic approach, and also the expectation of the client. Um, uh, look at uh, what the interstitial light or the... Um, incident light is you know are there car headlights sweeping across the building is it at an intersection will it be lit by headlights at night when people are stopped at a stoplight all those things are very very important to identify when you're arising of, of a venue you know even the sun direction is the sun going down behind the building or is it going down in front of the building which will influence mm. what time you can start it's wonderful being able to start projections while there's still sunlight in the sky it just adds another perspective to to the place and the time um, and then what approvals are going to be required? There are some sites which are just a, a bridge too far. If I told you, or if I had a dollar for every time the phone rings with somebody wanting to uh, advertise their product on the Sydney Opera House, I wouldn't be talking to you now. I'd be laying on a beach somewhere. But, you know, you know there are heritage sites and there are simply <laughs> corporately owned sites that just the approvals um, just to do a project would be impossible. But there's always some sort of approvals required, you know, whether you're putting infrastructure uh, in a public place or a private place and just you've got to convince people that there's no impact on the users of the building. Uh, for instance, with the Sydney Opera House, they want to know that light's not going to come through the windows into the Benelong restaurant, which is a fine dining restaurant, while you're lining up. They want to know that there's not going to be no light glaring people walking up the internal uh, granite, pink granite stairs on their way to the northern foyers and people are going to trip. Uh, you've got to assure them that the accuracy of what you do and the care you take in getting to that point where all those masks are in uh, is going to be treated uh, carefully and with respect. So all of these things go to, towards site selection. Um, after you've selected a site, of course, you've got to do the site survey. You've got to visit it during the day. You've got to visit it during the night. You've got to see what it looks like at night. You've got to take lots of photos from, from various angles, you know, because the... the people who are going to make the content for this needs to understand how the audience might see it. Mm. The audience aren't going to find the best position to look at things. Sometimes they will, but in a crowded audience, they might not have any choice. Uh, but sometimes I'll just stand at a corner and look at a, at a bleak angle. You've got to take all of that into consideration. And all of those photos do help with that. Um, you've got to understand the relationship of the building to the audience, um, uh, not only passing uh, foot traffic, and vehicular traffic, but where people are going to gather to look. Um, you've got to also look at what impact you're going to make on that site. You've got to put projection towers around the place. What's that going to look like during the day? Uh, how do you minimise that? How do you dress those towers? All of that's important. And then two other important aspects, where's the power going to come from? Mm. Are we going to have a dirty great generator sitting there puffing smoke? Uh, even though they're fairly good at that these days and uh, fairly well behaved from a smoke and... Uh, and uh, a sound point of view. 
what is the security aspects of putting infrastructure in this site? You might think it's a quiet part of town, but when you start to do projection, uh, especially near places of uh, drinking and, uh, and uh, fervent behaviour, you might find that people are more than just interested in what's in that box with the light. <laughs> um, although if anyone wants to steal any uh, 85 kilo projectors, I think... To myself, Good luck to them. Good luck to them <laughs> and try to sell them at the pub. But it's not about that. It's about the disruption to the delivery of the event. Uh, what shadow sources are there? How do you get around trees? In our country, I've got a frustration with we build beautiful buildings and then we put trees right in front of them. It doesn't seem to happen as much in in Europe, but that's what happens here. Are there poles to deal with? How do we how do we project on this building while shooting around poles? And we spend a lot of time on that wires, street furniture and, you know, bus shelters and, and the various things. And, and sometimes there just isn't a perfect solution, but sometimes if you work hard at it, there is a solution. So mm -hmm. explore all of those things and work out where you're going to put the projectors, not only to light the building well, uh, and to model it well from the audience's point of view, but to avoid those sort of undesirable uh, structures. Uh, we talked about the incident, uh, incidental light, but something that is also very important will come into approvals is driver distraction. Um, with the advent of digital signage, in particular big billboards, there were a lot of rules set out that are pretty standard all around the world. And at first they were fairly stringent and ridiculous to people in projection, like, do not use red or green, or people might think that building is a traffic light. Literally, I kid you not. Yeah. But um, and people might see the reflection of a building in some other window and think it's a traffic light. Um, the rules generally say you can't have animation. They generally say you can't change images more often than 30 seconds and you can't have crossfades. But there's always ways to reduce these risks and to convince local authorities that you're not creating risk. Mind you, there's very little precedent anywhere in the world that I know of, of an animated projection causing any... I had the same discussion with the government here. <laughs> yeah, so, but precedents don't sort of, they work in the negative sense, they don't always work in the positive sense. One thing that uh, Vivid Sydney, which is a big international light projection festival do is where there's considered to be driver distraction hazards, they put in a variable speed limit, they reduce the the speed limit to 40 kilometers an hour, which is 25 miles an hour, if you like, for those in uh, the US. And um, and they deem that then to be acceptable as people drive across the top of Circular Quay on the overhead uh, roadway. Uh, they can still see the Opera House, but at 40 kilometers an hour, they're not gonna hurt themselves as much is the theory. Mind you, Sydney Harbour is beautiful during the day as well. And you can, you've got to keep your eyes on the road. That's as simple yeah. as that. They're the things we have to deal with when it comes to, to site considerations. Um, then there's the use of sound. We all know that sound is a great uh, addition to, to, any, uh, to any projection. And uh, the term sonne lumière was, uh, was, was formed in France and that was the earliest forms of what we call projection mapping shows now. And, uh, and the soundtrack was just as important, if not more important than the visuals and was the motivator. But can you use sound? Will people hear it? Will it cause uh, issues with residences or commercial operations? Um, streets can often, often act like tunnels and what you think is a reasonable level at the site could be booming in somebody's window, you know, um, several hundred metres or yards away. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, you've got to take that into consideration. Do you use a big stereo sound system or do you use lots of small mono sources spread around the site we always like to have the sound coming from where the the pictures are coming that sort of makes sense it's a mm. it's a theatrical norm sometimes you can't do that so uh but wherever sound is involved uh it's it's always much more than the sum of its parts so uh, and the use of lighting as well uh, you know uh, modern projection systems media service can control lighting and um, to use lighting to light other architectural features or, or hidden coves or, or naves uh, that you can't get to with projection is a wonderful thing to do. It doesn't happen very often because it takes a level of engagement with other contractors and uh, a level of uh, on-site programming that uh, quite often doesn't fit the budget or the timeframes, but it's a wonderful thing to do. And uh, mm. to, to help us do that, we've got DMX control these days out of media servers. And if all else 
fails uh, the good old fashioned time code that we use in ceremonies. That means that uh, programming can take part independently and then synchronized accurately in a frame accurate way on site. So we still use time code to, uh, to link various technologies together. Um, so once buildings are selected and the survey is made, that is all the measurements and all the photographs, then we quite, a, we quite often go back and do a more accurate architectural survey, which might be more photographs, this time from the actual spots where we've decided to put projectors uh, from the actual lens height. We, we've, got a, we've got a tripod that goes to four and a half metres, you know, that's, uh, uh, you, know, that's uh, you know, 16 or 18 feet high. Um, so that we can put uh, a, a camera, a digital camera, where the projector lens is going to be if we don't have the means to do a, a total 3D uh, workflow. So um, uh, once the architectural survey is done and the measurements are made, the art department can get, then go ahead and make, uh, make a template or a series of templates. You know, if we're working with uh, collaborating artists who, who are not used to this genre, we might give them little sections of architecture, explain where they are, show them where they are, and get them to, to work directly on those so that we can compile that later on at the compositing phase uh, when we assemble everything together. Okay, so the, the content workflows are, are driven largely by available lead time, by budget, by what assets are available, you know, uh, the quality and the quantity of them, uh, what templates we've been able to do, and Richard will talk a little bit about some of the, the templating uh, methods we use and whether we're going to use visualization or not um, but the but the design always starts with the technical side first you know how bright does it need to be how bright can we make it and what will the resolution be and is it well lit uh, mm. from the projector's point of view um, so also the other site conditions apart from the lighting conditions we've talked about and the, and the, the audience viewing position is sometimes people are looking from great distance sometimes they're looking from very close up and do you accommodate both audiences and uh, mm. there's a number of uh, projects we do uh, which are multi-site projects one in particular comes to mind is in light and camera where we're working in a, a beautiful area for production it's a huge black dark place called the Ty parliamentary triangle that that houses parliament house and many great institutions like the national gallery of australia the national portrait gallery the national library questacon which is the museum of arts and science and um, and uh, also the old parliament house which is now the museum of australian democracy and they're, they're quite often visible from each other but the distances are quite large so we have to make sure that the message is carried or the theme is carried from those distances as well as when people get close up and personal with a particular building. Um, so at that point, Richard, if you want to speak about the templating a little bit, then I'll uh, talk about the combined uh, briefing that comes from both technical and creative for our artists. Mm. Well, perhaps we should show a video and then we can discuss. That's a very good idea. You know, like how we went around that particular job. Okay. So maybe let's do the Krillian job. Uh, well, we'll do that as a case study, so we'll, we'll wait mm -hmm. on that. But uh, let's do Enlighten because we've just been talking about that. Yeah. So I'm just going to start that video.
Okay, so that was Enlightened Canberra. Uh, all of the creative was the electric canvas, except for the National uh, Gallery of Australia, which was a collab on the brutalist architecture of the National Gallery of Australia, which uh, is a wonderfully satisfying thing to do on a number of levels, not the least is getting the trust of Australia's premier uh, art gallery uh, in being able to put a new work on the outside of their institution. So, Richard, would you like to talk about some of the challenges and uh, how we went about um, doing Enlighten? Yeah, so we've got a wide range of templating styles in uh, that festival. Um, a lot of the brutalist architecture is really conducive to sort of a orthographic unwrap, which is, you know, sort of like flattening out the faces into, you know, a flat sort of right angled uh, type template. Um, which uh, allows you to, you know, like a, it's sort of dealing with faces or sides of the building. Um, it, it's a bit, we're taking artwork from an artist which had done a lot of 16.9 content, um, so short works, and either taking, taking their work, either integrating it by furthering the design across the building or doing uh, extensions or then providing elements because um, they, they're based, they do a lot of After Effects work. So we could get elements which were already uh, masked out where we could extend the backgrounds to the whole building and, you know, develop scenes, you know, take away from, you know, work with them to develop it from their original work and their original intent and make it into something much, you know, larger and expansive, which is really going to, envelop the viewer um, on site. Um, there are a few other sites which we authored also using that sort of orthographic, very flat templating. But then there's other ones where we're sort of doing a um, projector POV where we're then doing POV but straightening out the POV and creating flat templates for artists to work across. So yeah, like, like very various styles across the whole project. Uh, interesting to note that two of those venues in this year's uh, Enlighten, which was the last project we did before lockdown, it finished at the beginning of March, two of those uh, venues are actually still PG projectors. Uh, you know, we, we deliver a large footprint, many buildings, I think it's eight buildings, including some that are not shown, uh, on a very limited and tight budget. And uh, uh, that was our ninth, I know, our tenth, uh, activation of Enlighten. We were there since the very beginning and we're very proud to have worked with festivals such as Enlighten to uh, take them in their fledgling years where hardly anyone turned up uh, to now being uh, one of the most popular uh, events in the, in the country. So uh, we, we like to communicate to our clients that we're there for them for the long run and we, we're, we're always thinking about the years ahead and, and how we can help them improve uh, what they deliver to the public. And I guess that process becomes, uh, you know, a routine when you're doing it every year and then you can grow and expand as a, as a client, you know, company relationship to really, you know, up, up the ante, I guess, every time, right? Because they're going to want more and more every time to sort of surprise the audience. And, and, and it's a very, very good motivation to, uh, to, uh, to get them to issue multi-year contracts. If yeah. you've got a new client and they're not sure how things are going to go and they give you a one-year contract, you're less inclined to be to be investing time and effort into future years if it's going to go back out to tender. The tender process, I'm sure it's the same all over the world, is onerous, lengthy, time-consuming and therefore expensive. And uh, We need more of that. We need more long-term relationships. <laughs> absolutely. In a, in a world... Oh, you cut out. Was it me there you go. Oh, no. I can't hear you, Peter. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry. I must have accidentally toggled my audio off. Sorry, I'm back. Yeah, there you go. Sorry about that. Yeah, so it, it certainly helps. Uh, for instance, that Enlightened project, we've just won an additional contract for the next three plus two years, which means we can really start to invest in it. So uh next year it'll be all digital um it started as all pg because of the yeah. very limited budget so we'd like to be part of the growth of uh, of the projects and, and be a good partner for our clients uh, uh so uh, it, we're, we're i'm just conscious of time peter do we want to talk about your case study in terms of yeah the... we, we can certainly do that um so uh 
I've got a little uh, PowerPoint presentation to, to show. Uh, we were approached just before lockdown uh, in, in March uh, about the possibility of projecting on the National Carillion in Canberra, which is the capital of Australia. Now, the National Carillion, a Carillion is an instrument made up of many bells and it's played with a clavier like a keyboard and it's generally a building on a large scale. So I'm just going to load up that slideshow and introduce... Oh, it's not there anymore. I've got it for you. Very. Yeah, I've got it. Thank you. There you go. Uh, oh, now I can see it. Right. Yeah. So the National Carillion, uh, it had been dormant for some time because they were adding a bell to it that was cast in the original factory in England uh, where the bells were cast, and it was a bell that weighed several tonnes. Uh, so they'd just finished putting this bell in and they wanted to announce uh, the restarting of the, the Carillion as a musical instrument and... Um, and it also its 50th anniversary. It was opened by uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth in 1970. It's some um, 50 metres, let's say 150 foot tall. It's on an island that's accessible by a walking bridge in Lake Burley Griffin, which is a man-made lake uh, upon which Canberra was so elegantly designed. Um, you can see some views of the Carillion here. You can go onto the island. There's quite a large area for people to gather. Uh, although for our first activation, it was locked off because of COVID. Uh, our first activation was for National Reconciliation Week and uh, National Reconciliation Week celebrates uh, the long process that started many years ago about reconciling um, the First Nations people of Australia uh, with the European um, uh, colonisation of Australia. Uh, this is a view from the top of the Carillion. This is where we put our crew headquarters. It's quite a nice little place to be. It's a small Oh, um, yeah, it's a great spot. yeah, so that's a good spot and it's a very cold and windswept island. I've just come back from there and as you can hear from my croaky voice, I didn't come back in very good condition. But uh, <laughs> So uh, in, uh, in, in a very quick uh, survey, we, we decided that we could cover the Carillion from four projection towers um, shown here and we developed a language to work with the, with the client. Um, uh, we just named the three triangular columns that form the Carillion um, with numbers and uh, and uh, letters. Um, so you see A, B and C and the faces on those, one, two and three. You can also see from the little photos uh, down the bottom that uh, uh, that the, the bell chamber is the big chamber with all the slots in it. It's got some 60 odd bells from very small ones right up to the nine ton lower G bell. Above that is uh, a viewing room where we have our headquarters and below the bell chamber is the actual clavier room where they play the instrument. Uh, so we developed very early um, uh, where we could cover the, uh, the Carillion from. And then we had to communicate to the client where the audience can see it from. So we developed this little map that shows where the, the island is. You can see it up there at the top. And uh, we developed certain what we thought would be popular viewpoints and uh, the red lines indicate where you can see it from when you're in a vehicle. And uh, we took photos from those viewpoints and we also developed a 3D model from a laser survey that I shot on site very quickly, just a, a, a point to point uh, uh, wireframe that then Richard turned into a 3D model so we could visualize from these various points because this point View D there is about 850 metres away or about uh, 820 yards, uh, or is it the other way around? Yards are, are smaller than metres, yes, so uh, uh, about 900 yards. So, um, but you can always also be on the island or on the foreshore near the island, which is only about 100 yards. Um, so uh, we created a 3D model. Um, uh, because uh, the interesting thing about this is we had about four weeks to create the content, but we were working with, and I want to say it was about nine separate indigenous cultural groups, uh, agencies and individual artists. They all had to be uh, indoctrinated into what it means to work on a building like this, uh, what the constraints of projection are, and uh, how we might have to be trusted to actually um, divide up their work and display it in different ways. Very early in the piece, uh, you'll see a, f 
face C2, uh, when I was surveying, I decided that we had to make use of that internal wall. It's the only internal wall that we cover because when you walk across the curved bridge you saw, that wall is where you arrive at the Carillion. So we use that wall for people that are on the island to give more detail and to provide any artworks that we had to crop or compose into the shapes of the Carillion, uh, we could provide those in their entirety, sort of like a gallery. So there's a, there's a, um, a, a, a view of, uh, that's actually from the current activation that's in its, going into its third night out of a week tonight. Uh, and that's for NADOC week, which is a, a week where we celebrate indigenous culture and art. So once again, we're working with a total of uh, 12 indigenous artist groups from all around the country, showcasing their work and asking for their trust to be able to um, apply their work in a, in a way that works with the architecture. You can see that C2, uh, we call it uh, face on the inside there and people on the island can get quite close to that and actually read detail. There it is there in close up. Um, so that was a very important part. And that's part of, of the projection design process is, is determining what the theatrical opportunities are and placing the projectors accordingly. Um, there's some views of, uh, uh, from one particular viewpoint showing that inside face from on the island. This was on Sunday night, just past. And here's a view of the same artwork from uh, a walk around from different, uh, uh, different parts of, uh, of the island. It's beautiful. Yeah, so it was very bright, looked great at dusk. Um, and, and there's uh, not a lot of um, ambient light around there either, right, at night? It looks no, it's, quite it's, dark. It's good. it's good for ambient light. And just let's look at our earlier activation on video, if I could just play that, uh, for some fantastic drone footage, and don't we love the drone? <laughs> And it's important to acknowledge each and every one of the collaborators and contributors for this. Um, uh, without their beautiful work, we wouldn't have had the wonderful images to work with. And uh, thank them also for their trust in letting us use their stories and, uh, and their beautiful uh, creations to do such a worthwhile thing on the National Crew. Mm, it's amazing. So it might be a good time for for questions, do you think? Uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, please do tell us. Um, I think you've got a couple of other videos that would be nice to show just before we finish up as well because you've got yep. a large uh, quality of work. Um, so thanks, everybody, for um, sticking out with us past 9 o'clock. And if you've got any questions, I mean, Peter and Richard have been wonderfully generous with your information and the process is really fascinating uh so i hope you've been taking notes so if anyone has any questions please ask them now otherwise uh peter maybe we uh show a couple of the other videos while you've got them you can talk a little bit in our last 15 minutes perhaps about the last couple of uh, case studies you've got okay uh, we like to do ground projections uh, we find that they're very immersive and uh almost interactive if you like so we've got a little show reel that shows those and then i'll talk about the considerations when you are projecting onto the ground
So the important thing with ground projections is resolution uh, mm. and brightness. Uh, when your eyes are about five feet or 1.5 meters away from your screen, the pixels have to be very, very small. So we use, uh, not they're not UHD projectors, they're actual cinema 4K projectors. So they do 4,096 pixels by 2160. And uh, some of those installations used up to four of those. So uh, it's it's really important that uh, uh, that you get that fine grain uh, and that high resolution if if uh, if you want it to be engaging. Uh, mm. Also, another consideration with ground projections is where you can we overlap the projectors so that there's a projector from each side. You generally can't get the projectors directly overhead except yeah. in some very rare circumstances. If you overlap them from a tower either side, then any shadows that are created by participants will only be a 50% shadow. It takes a little bit longer to line up and keep it lined up to, uh, to be pixel accurate, but it's certainly well worth doing. Mm. Um, the other video we've got, I can't actually see. Anna, we have well, we've got a, uh, we might play that in a second. We've got a couple of questions. So I'll start oh, with uh, one from Andrew. Have you got any, do you do any permit installs like in retail? Um, uh, and then Andrew said, do you have any live updating shows that track artists and update renderer portion live? I don't understand yeah, that. Look, Maybe you understand that. I, I, I think I do. Uh, we get approached all the time to do retail type activations that, the challenge is, of course, that retail spaces, by their very nature, are quite well lit, uh, both from a public safety point of view and because you want to um, uh, you want to light the product. Um, the time to engage with retail spaces is when you're planning uh, a shopping centre or a retail uh, venue, because and we're working on a couple of those at the moment. Generally, and it's an area I haven't spoken to. We do a lot of consultancy, or over the years we have with. Uh, doing a couple of major consultancies at the moment. We've just been involved in an installation of a new immersive space at the Sydney Opera House, which only holds 30 people, but it's still going on the uh, the International uh, Heritage Register as an extra theatre. Uh, so we've been involved in the later stages of that. Um, so we, we do get involved in permanent installations. We apply the same sort of methodologies that we do for our temporary installations. And uh, the reason we're getting into more and more is the advent of lampless projectors, because uh, I quite often gave the advice to people, do not do a permanent installation on your building unless you are prepared to support it with do all the maintenance and maintenance everything that's required. And yeah. the cost of lamps very regularly, uh, because there's nothing worse than putting your heart and soul in an installation, driving past it a year later and seeing it dull and lifeless. Mm. So. With the advent of laser phosphor and uh, you know light engine times of uh, lives of up to twenty thousand hours down to seventy percent brightness, that whole world has changed. So we're working on a number of uh, installations with uh, architects, engineers, designers at the moment, and uh, that's an area we quite like to do. Uh, like to be Wonderful. Involved. As what's to the, uh, what's oh, sorry. Your, oh, so, sorry, I was just going to jump in. What's your preferred mapping software while we're talking? Oh, about well, that's a very good right? question. Uh, we use something that some of you may have heard of. It's called Modulo from France. And uh, we go back a long way with the developer of Modulo. When we were working a lot with ATC Audiovisuel in Paris uh, using their PG projectors, uh, the guy that created the software that ran the PG projectors, and we still use it, uh, Yannick Cohen. Uh, also developed a thing called Only Q Only View, which was a video media server, and it's been used most recently Rio Olympics. It was used; it'll be used in the opening closing ceremony in Tokyo next year. And that that product still lives on, and we used Only View for a number of years. Um, then uh, Yannick left ETC and went to uh, uh, create his own company called Modulo Pi, and he's created Modulo, uh, which is a wonderful product, very solid, uh, very articulate, easy to use. It's a it's a good alternative to Disguise or D3, as some people know it. Um, and uh, we use that almost exclusively. We still use some Watch Out for some projects, but uh, the Modulo Player, which is a list based uh, analogy, and Modulo Kinetic, which is a timeline-based uh, uh, solution, which also has uh, generative content, uh, motion tracking, you know, a lot of other bells and whistles. We use both of those platforms. Uh, it's it's a good platform for us because uh, the both Modulo products, you can actually path the various surfaces you're projecting onto in Photoshop 
and then drop that Photoshop file into Modulo and all of the areas, regions of interest are ready there for you to put handles on and to, and to warp. Uh, no more warping one area and looking over and seeing that you've disturbed another area. Those areas are completed, uh, uh, are treated completely independently. It's called X, X mapping. And also once you've got all the X map shapes, you can make masks, blends, areas, areas that have got a combination of soft and hard edge blends. It's a great system. And because the Modulo player in particular works as a remote, and there is no master computer. If you've got four or five different media servers uh, delivering projectors across a site to different uh, surfaces of the same building or even different buildings, each one can have a different technician logged onto it at any one time. And they can be lining up or making adjustments or programming independently. And at any time, another technician can take control over, over the whole system or, or any uh, any of those servers. So it's the reason I like Modulo is it's been built from the ground up by people that actually go and do this stuff. And that was mm. uh, Yannick working at ETC who were leaders in Sonic Lumiere and, and large format projection across public events and uh, broadcast events for many, many years and still are. And uh, uh, it was direct connection to technicians coming back and saying, we can't use this software anymore. We need something that does what we do. And, uh, mm -hmm. and also the other advantage of it is that uh, we can contact Yannick, he's a small enough country company, he has a company of some 20 people, uh, and ask for a feature. And he will do his best to provide that feature for us. Uh, so it's a great relationship. So we use Modulo uh, almost exclusively. We still use Watchout, it's a very solid product and we have many watch out licenses, but uh, that's the answer to that. As, as far as uh, the, the second part of the question, which was, uh, do we have a way to update? I think it was dynamic updating of content in a, in a permanent installation. We do. Once again, Modulo supports that very well. And uh, with a web interface, you could load content. And uh, if we had more time, I'd tell you about a couple of case studies, but I think we're running out pretty rapidly. <laughs> yeah, we might have to do a second session. What, what, what another question, which is a really good one, perhaps for some of the younger people on on the the webinar, is what, what what would you advise people who are trying to get started in this this aspect of the entertainment industry? How to how could they get started in this process? Well, look, I'll let Richard ask answer some of this, but my answer is very very quick and straightforward. Grab a laptop, borrow or steal somebody's desktop projector, and go and use some of the free mapping software onto anything in a public space don't get caught uh, or uh, you know, <laughs> in your own home and just learn how the light works. That's really what it is. And um, Richard will tell you that there's a lot of stuff out there that you can do. You don't have to spend uh, yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it. Yeah, the, the entry level, you know, it, it's, it's really, it's much easier to get into than it has ever been. You know, like projectors are far more accessible you know you can even get like mini projectors and you know like do scale models of things and you know but be creative at a smaller scale um do small you know projection installations there's there's a lot of um outlets for that sort of work now and it it does scale up i won't say it's a simple scale up to the, the scale we're doing but you the know principles are the, same. The, the principles are the same and you know practice makes perfect so yeah What's your hardest install so far? What's your hardest project that you've that's had the most hurdles? You got uh, one on the list? Well, it's going to take three and a half minutes to tell you. <laughs> okay. Uh, it was one of the earliest ones we did back in 2000 for the Sydney Olympics. And uh, uh, both in the opening and closing ceremony, we had PG projection. In the opening ceremony, the PG projection was a very simple image of a dove. You have to have, there's seven deliverables of an Olympic ceremony. One of them is doves. Uh, another is <laughs> the Olympic the Greeks. Um, Another one's a flag hanger, but the doves are important. Uh, you've got to have the doves or you're not deemed to have delivered an Olympic ceremony. So uh, we had to project the dove onto a giant flag. But the problem is the flag wasn't on the ground. It wasn't flying on a flagpole. It was held aloft by 8,000 athletes. Um, and it started its life above the northern stand. You know, 25,000 people passing it down onto the field of play. And in so the they had last to move with it? Yeah, no, we didn't have to move with it. We had a separate set of projectors to illuminate famous sporting moments on it as it came down over the heads of the public. Mind you, at the rehearsal several days before, it tore, it caught on a projector, uh, oh, sorry, on a uh, 
on a broadcast camera scaffold and it just tore and there was no stopping it. Luckily, they had a spare one. It was huge. It was 80 metres by 40 metres, uh, wow. about the same in yards. So, but how do you align projectors on an imaginary flag without getting 8,000 people to hold it up while you do the alignment? Uh, our solution there was we put a biggest sheet of white uh, white material, uh, uh, plywood on top of a, a golf buggy. We drove it around looking for the blends between the big PG projectors on the field of play at approximately the right height. And then even then, it wasn't perfect. As that image faded up on the night in front of the world, I was moving projector film and feet on projectors to to coalesce the image uh, in, in real time in front of the, the world. So that was an instance where you, the first time we saw it projected as it was meant to be was the first time that several billion people saw it. The opening ceremony was a challenge as a uh, closing ceremony was a challenge as well. There was a giant de a geodesic shape which was made out of a carnival ride actually in the middle of the field of play. It started off as a flat stage and then eventually became a 12 sided um, three dimensional figure. And then in the finale rose up another 15 meters on, on its central mast. That wasn't going to be working until the gates were open. So we, uh, it was involved in rehearsals out at a secret or not so secret rehearsal site, an old military airfield uh, west of Sydney. We emulated where the projectors would be. We'd surveyed them in the in the stadium. We've got a surveyor involved, and we put the projectors on scissor lifts at the correct geometric geometrical positions. We mapped the images onto onto that. We made the film. Uh, we tracked it through its various shapes, its half height, its full height, and its mast extension. Programmed all of that to time code out at site, marked everything carefully on the projectors, transported everything back to the stadium. Of course, the closing ceremony uh, happens almost immediately after the last event, which is the marathon. So uh, there's very little time. After the marathon happens, then you can start what's called transition to closing, and an army descends on the field of play and turns a sporting venue into a theater again and uh, so during that process they brought this thing in they set it up we set the projectors up uh, but it wasn't until 4 30 in the afternoon when the gates were already up into the public that they actually got this thing going and we were trying to convince a french technician that we had there helping us how we were going to line the thing up without a nighttime lineup but because we knew we could turn projectors into camera obscurers uh, we knew how to do it and as soon as they got that thing erect to its full geodesic 12-sided uh, geometric shape. We threw a hood over the uh, each projector and got underneath the hood and projected the light from the field of play back down onto the image gate where we put a piece of white paper behind an outline that we created of the geodesic dome. And we did focus and positioning. And that's how we uh, focused the projector <laughs> by seeing the light sh shone down the lens of the projector. And our French guy, Nico, who is one of the top uh, projection guys in the world, suddenly got it. He said, ah, now I get it. And he ran around to the other projectors and quickly lined them up. So uh, when we saw it for the first time, as the world saw it, just a couple of small tweaks and uh, it ran perfectly to the time code. And I love to tell that story because people told us we couldn't do it and we knew we could. So, <laughs> That's that amazing. Still That's stands amazing. out as uh, something difficult, only because people said it couldn't be done. Yeah, that's wonderful. Now, I know we've got a lot of questions, but we are running out of time. I wonder if you guys are okay if you could put, if if they could ask you via email any pressing questions, would you be okay sure. with, with that? If sure. one of you could just put your email in the chat box there, I'd love it. We're going to wrap up in just a second. I do want to promo, oh. we've got another discussion tomorrow before we say goodbye to these wonderful gentlemen. We've got another discussion tomorrow with uh, Mark Brickman, who designs the lighting for the Empire State Building. And um, you can register at Theatre Art Life, or I think uh, also Rex is going to put the registration link in the uh, chat box here. Uh, and that's tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is New York time, which is about 2 a.m. in the morning for me. So that's going to be a wonderful, uh, uh, <laughs> a wonderful uh, late night discussion for me. Um, so. Thank you, Richard and Peter. I mean, you've just given us so much information today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and spending some time. And guys who are watching, if uh, 
if you do want more regarding projection mapping and stuff, I'm sure we can uh, work tomorrow. I think Peter and Richard could speak for days about their knowledge and experience. I think we, we're only just getting this discussion started. So thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. Thanks for having us, Anna. Wonderful. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And um, join us again for our, our next session on Theatre Art Live. Signing out now. Bye.